My name is Joe Ryan, I'm from Clemson University. Um, behavior has been my passion for many years. I was an ED teacher for self-contained, for gen ed, for special day school and residential facilities. Uh, went on to higher ed, I started to run the Clemson Life Program, post-secondary education program for young adults with intellectual disabilities on uh, Clemson. And worked with behavior from the minute I got into teaching as a gen ed math teacher all the way through, it never leaves. I was just off the phone with my director back there and we have behavior management issues again. So it, it will never leave you. Uh, whether you're a teacher or even if you're a mom and dad, you'll always have behavioral issues that you're gonna be dealing with. And that's why it makes it fun. We have great bar stories for Friday happy hour there. What we're gonna talk about is behavior management. This is kinda, and again, I apologize for whatever reason, this did not get uploaded with the other presentations. I will make sure it's uploaded this afternoon there. So just sit back and relax and enjoy. So, uh, but you'll, you'll see the PDF uh, presentation here later this afternoon for it. We're gonna talk about a couple of different things. We're gonna talk about preventive measure, effective educational practices, positive interventions, and mildly intrusive preventions there, okay? So basically primary and second level interventions if you're looking at the pyramid there. Think of it almost like, I mean, again, sensory overload, I don't know about you, but I always get confused when I go to the Chinese restaurant and there's like 150 things to choose from and you're kind of like sensory overload, I don't even know what. Some things you're gonna like, some things you're not going to agree with. Basically, what you want to build, the, the key what I work with my teacher candidates is to build enough of a repertoire of behavioral interventions that you're comfortable with implementing, okay? Based on the age group that you go to, some of you may be early childhood, others in middle school or whatever, some in the secondary and high school. Some may not be appropriate based on the age groups that you're dealing with. So you need to find those things, but you need to have a wide array because remember, no one th intervention is gonna work with any one child 100% of the time. So you have to have a nice repertoire to go back to, but more important, we're gonna talk about the underlying behavioral concepts of why things work. Unfortunately, many teachers go into their knowing tricks of the trade, but they don't know why a behavioral intervention works and why it doesn't work. So we're gonna go a little bit deeper than that. The more disturbing thing, however, is basically 43% of teacher preparation programs don't teach behavior management to teachers. And now you gotta be beating your head against the wall if you're on me or whatever else. I was a lead teacher or whatever else and you start talking about behavioral concepts and, I'm, and they just look at you like your lab, you know, and just kinda like, what are you talking about? It's like, so understanding is based on the level and the background of people. Some of your teachers may have absolutely no training at all. Some of you may have some basic rudimentary, such as like Wang and Wang's, you know, whatever, first day of school or whatever else. I think everybody in gen ed, pretty much that was their basics that they go through with there. So some of you may be more advanced, applied behavior analysis, working on BCBAs and everything else. So you're gonna have a spectrum of teachers that you're dealing with in their understanding and the grasp of the concepts. So let's just figure out who we have here is how many are SPED teachers right here? How many? How many administrators? Yeah, you see all the recurrent problem behaviors there all the time, the administrators there. How many counselors? All righty, how many behavior specialists? One or two, and then any others that I did not mention there, any other specialties that I'm not there? Gen Ed. Gen Ed, awesome, outstanding, <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna talk about, again, we're gonna talk about, these are the things that for effective educational practices, we're gonna talk about why they're challenges, why they create problem behaviors there. So number one is, Appropriate motivating curriculum. Now, as a special educator, whether you're LD, ID, or, you know, or ED, you go into the classroom and you understand that even though you're a high school student, that your student's reading at a third grade level. But you don't see accommodations being made for somebody who's reading at a third grade level. And the teacher's wondering why there's behavioral episodes within the classroom there. Think of yourself, if I brought you back to Clemson and threw you into an EE, electro, electrical engineers majors or whatever else, how long would you hang with that classroom before you start being distracted, doing something else or whatever, not tracking along? That's what's happening to many of our children in, in the classroom there when it's not being accommodations there, okay? This is the first thing I would grab when I would go into a child's classroom, is the Fry readability graph. How many use this on a regular basis? You should all have this, plastered on the inside of your folders there every time you go to see the thing. When do kids get most likely identified for special needs? What, what grade level? About third grade. About third grade. Isn't that amazing? Why is that? State testing. What are you doing for grades one and two? Teaching to read. What are you doing from grades three and on? 
teaching content with reading. Do you see where the discrepancy falls on that one there? And so suddenly, so you have kids with LD, ED, or whatever else, and typically have a morbidity of the different disorders. They'll be reading at 1.2 grade level, and now they're in third grade. You're trying to teach science, history, everything else with that. What are most textbooks, what level are they written at? Two grades above. One and a half to two grade levels above. So now do you see why third grade is suddenly is you're giving a child who's reading at first grade level, 1.2, we'll give the Woodcock Johnson find out is, he's in third grade, he's reading a textbook written at four and a half to the fifth grade level. You have a four grade level discrepancy between what his ability is, okay, and what you're providing the information. So I've been swim coaching for decades or whatever else. I don't take somebody who's just in the middle of this thing learning how to swim and throw them in for the butterfly lane or whatever else. He or she's way over their heads. And that's what we do to too many of our children. And you anticipate, anticipate when it happens is you're going to have behavioral episodes in the classroom. So one of the first things we need to do is make sure that those accommodations are being made for our students with reading deficits so they're not being left behind. Because if I'm bored, I guarantee you, I'm going to do something to fill my time. And it's most likely not going to be sit quietly there patiently just looking at the teacher and trying to follow it. After about five or ten minutes, I'm going to start instigating peers and everything else. And so you see the beginning of problem behaviors. Assistive technology. Assistive technology is wonderful. I live and die by this in Clemson Life. I invest about 10 grand a year with a computer science event dividing assistive technology devices to help our students with intellectual disabilities on the job market, help them shopping, help live independently there. We start using them in kindergarten, Hoyle grips, anything that assists is assistive technology there. All right. Again, if you're not aware of being incorporating assistive technology in the classrooms, please, please go to Voc Rehab. You will learn more wonderful things about how Voc Rehab, uh, assistive technology being incorporated in the classroom. And again, to prevent problem behaviors for engaging the students academically there. This is the first thing I typically work, look at the minute I step into somebody's classroom, environmental engineering. This is the number one thing, okay? Was it fun registering today? Was that, wasn't that fun? <laughs> What was wrong with that? Oh, so they, it looked like a lot of problems. It was like, and I saw people online for like five or ten minutes, and they're like, oh, dang, my name doesn't begin with R or whatever else. And then you're shifting over the lines and everything else. That's environmental engineering. That's exactly what that is. How do you set up a classroom? So in other words, if I'm going to break and I'm going to have art equipment and everything else, how do I set it up so I don't have all my kids diving for the same equipment the same There's only so many points because somebody pushes and shoves, you transition. So do you have hallways that are so narrow from old school? Some have more modern ones that are almost like college campuses, but the older ones, traditionally narrow ones, do you have certain staircases that go up? Certain staircases where students only go down, okay? How do you set up your classroom? Do you have different sections or whatever to work with? Reading area, some place where you can work as a group, other places where they can go independently there. All critical questions. So the minute you go into a classroom where the teacher's having a lot of behavioral problems, first thing to look at is ecological environment, that breakdown, okay? That's a perfect example right there. So we just, we just sponsored, uh, whatchamacallit, my church, I organized the Night to Shine for the Tim Tebow. It's the same thing. Anytime you have 700 people, whatever else, coming all in one area, whatever else is, how do you get them in and out of a confined area without causing tension? Otherwise, you're gonna have friction, okay? And friction with young kids means what? Fights, okay? So again, look at the environment engineer of the setup there, and I love this one. Yeah, dear teacher, I talked to everyone, so moving my seat will not help. <laughs> All right, proximity control. I can't emphasize this one enough there, okay? How close do you get to people, okay, to your class? If you're environmental, going back to the environmental engineering is, if you're up at the board all the time, look at my corners of the classroom. How many times does the teacher ever get back to the corners of the classroom? Is it even possible to get to a certain one based on the structure and everything else? I may never, ever be able to get proximity to you there. But all I have to do is, especially, I don't need to interfere with my class or anything else or break it up and say get on task. All I have to do is teach from here. Is there any doubt in my presence here? Do you, is there any doubt in your mind at all that the instructor is right by you or whatever else there? And even if you're not paying attention, you're pretending to pay attention really, really well, aren't you, Christy? <laughs> Proximity control is, and again, walk. This is something that the teachers need guidance with. So you need, when you're doing an observation of a student, also observe the teachers. Now, I had a lot of, traditionally with ADHD, is the location of where the student's located. I've had, you know, teachers, very senior teachers in their 30 years, and she, you know, first name was? Kira. Kira. You know, Kira's not listening. Kira's not responding. You know, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, well, Kira's on the opposite side of the classroom, okay? 
In other words, is, and you never once walked over to sit, talk to her or whatever else and more or less make eye contact. And talking with a student with ADHD without making eye contact, you were just wasting your breath. I don't care if you sold her five times because she was not paying attention until you actually have eye contact. Kira, get eye contact, give the command, okay? Don't waste your breath on that. So proximity is huge. Do not be anchored. Teachers, especially new teachers, are very much tethered to the front and to their desk. Okay? Desk is only for what? That's your safe spot for storing your purse, backpack, or whatever you want to do. No students around. You don't go there until all the students are gone. Okay? There's no reason to ever be there. Okay? Within this, Jacob Coonan, he tagged this back in the 60s there, is understanding the relationships with the students have with the teachers as well as with themselves, okay? the, other, the other peers. This is one of the reasons that substitutes have awful days, don't they? How many here have ever been long-term sub or anything else or whatever else? Yeah, remember your days on that one there? Okay. This is why, because you don't know, and we're going to talk tomorrow, I'm going to show about de-escalation, and we're talking about the cycle of aggression, is the problem is a substitute doesn't know what the child's baseline is. They don't know if they're normally act hyperactive, if they're normally internalizing behaviors or whatever. This is why for ED classes, you should always have the exact same sub every time, okay, if at all possible there. Don't put new people in there. Because what happens is the sub, the, guy, I, I, the dust went flying, I don't know what happened or whatever else, is because you never noticed the child going up the cycle of aggression and the difference between their baseline performance and as they were escalating. So the witness is the understanding the, the kids themselves and their relationships, because I may not understand, I can't put Steve next to it was a Lauren again or whatever else, because they are best friends and they talk all the time or whatever else. But maybe their contract is, you do, you'll be good, then you guys can play together, recess or whatever it may be. In other words, it's the withness factor there. Or that they hate each other because they just broke up. Whoever knows what the, you know, the withness of the, the situation. This one I can't emphasize enough, and this is challenging. Even when you know it. Positive reinforcement of the students at a ratio of five to one. Now, the first observation, there's eight observations, I did this on the last thing, was the different frequency, you know, partial end of all these different observations, all my teacher candidates have to do. The first observation is not on any student. The first observation they, my teacher candidates do is on the teacher. And the first thing is very simple, frequency count. How many positive reinforcing things do they say to their students to how many negative? And they come back with the ratio. What do you think the average ratio is? The goal should be five positive. Good job, Steve. Thank you for the work. Good job. Five to one negative correcting a student. What do you think the average teacher comes back with? One to five. Opposite way around. Yeah. I've had teacher candidates come back and say it was 25 negative and I just stopped because she did not say anything positive in the classroom. Think back to your employment, when high school, college, or whatever else. Anybody here have a lousy job? Just an awful place to work with? You know, whatever else? Was it because of, uh, maybe the boss was kind of mean? Yeah. Did you really want to be there? Could you, you're like, gosh, I can't wait to show up to work today at 8 o'clock or whatever else and be belittled by my boss or whatever else. Imagine what it's like for your students, knowing that they're going into a classroom, that the majority of all the comments that the person in charge of that classroom is saying is negative to you. If the administrator only came into your classroom and said, Lauren, I can't believe you're wearing that today. Lauren, I can't believe you're, in other words, is every interaction that you had with somebody above you was all negative, I guarantee you'd be looking for new jobs pretty quickly or putting feelers out. Understand the importance of this, especially for kids with disabilities when their failure rate is so much higher than the general population. Okay? So you have to create a warm environment where they're risk takers because most kids with disabilities, they're not risk takers. Even if they do know the answer, they're not going to raise their hand because more than likely they know they're going to be what? They're going to be wrong. But if they get reinforced to even trying, nice try about it, that, it needs to be a safe environment for them. The way you do that is five to one. The other thing is, is what you'll find in a lot of classrooms when you go in there is the only time they get the teacher's attention is when it's what? When it's negative. That's absolutely wrong. Because remember, any attention is better than no attention. So what I want is the positive attention reinforcing. Because again, is if I reinforce Steve for being on task or doing something pro-social, guess what? Lauren's also going to want the praise. And she's going to do that same behavior. When I reward something, that's when it's more likely to occur again that, through that reinforcement. You understand? So those are the important concepts. And this is tough. When I work residential, we had counselors come in several times a week through one of your classes, and they would just do the tele count. And then you'd have to sit with the administrator on Friday and go, Joe, 
here's your ratio. And it's challenging when you've got kids with serious self-injurious physical aggression and everything else to try to keep that now. And you can't get fake praise. So again, is the minute you're correct, you're trying to re-engage them. Thank you for re-engagement or whatever else. You know, and re-engage them and be as positive as possible. So try that. If you're in an administrative role or whatever, watch your teachers and keep a tally the next time you're in there and see if it's a positive reinforcement, a classroom that a kid wants to get to, or especially if those, you know, the administrators, raise your hand if you can set your watch by the time the kid, Joey shows up in your office. Go into that one and to see what the positive negative ratio is for Joey in there. Because more than likely, it's not going to be a five to one. Joey wouldn't be trying to escape that environment from the math class, science, or whatever else is if he's always trying to escape. One of the reasons the kids always escape is they don't want to be here. Okay? And if a student's, oh, yeah, again, it's not rocket science here. And if a student's always being picked on by the teacher and everything else, being, you know, he or she's going to try really hard to escape to get out of there. So try to keep the five to one. Home notes. These work wonderful at the beginning of the year, don't they? What happens if they go negative, though? How many here have parents answer that phone when you call in September? How many answer by October? How many goes right to voicemail? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Every time that you make a phone call to a parent, it works the same thing, that reinforcement. Every time, if you want the parent's help when Joey's acting up, you'd better be calling the parent, sending notes home, okay, when Joey's doing a good job. So if you want, the, you want the response from the parent, you'd better be sending those notes, calling up, and hey, Joey did a really good job in math today. Joey did a really good job in whatever else and reinforcing. Otherwise, it's going right to voicemail. I guarantee they're not going to be picking up there. Okay? So understand, now that's tough. And you go, Joe, I'm, I'm, you know, last conference I did was, I'm an art teacher. I got like 200 kids or whatever else coming through, you know, whatever. I, I've got 20 kids, 40 kids. How the heck do I possibly communicate with 20 or 40 kids? Talk amongst yourselves for 30 seconds. Figure it out for me. It's an easy way to do it. Talk to your buddy. All right, let's hear some great ideas. We've got brilliant teachers here, okay? Let's hear some great ideas. How do I communicate on a regular basis with a large number of students? pre and communal notes could do that, but I'm still, I got 40 kids. That's still a lot, but I do like that. How'd you register today? Was it A to G? H to L or whatever else? Could I do Mondays? I do A to H or whatever last names or first names or whatever else. Break it up that way. Okay, so in other words, it's on a regular basis, it's not maybe like preschool where they hear every day on the report card, but in high school or whatever else, at least once a week on a regular basis, they're getting feedback on my son or daughter's performance. Does that make sense? So it's a very, and then the special students may hear a little bit more frequently on a regular basis because we may be on a check-in, check-out basis. We'll talk about later or whatever. They get a, a daily report card there. Okay. Instructional pacing. This is critical. Okay. Important to keep the pace going, especially with kids with disabilities there. Monitoring performance, the buy-in from the student performance, okay? A week is even a long time for our kids, okay? Looking forward to a week. So performance over a quarter or whatever else, I mean, that, they can't even conceptualize that. You know, Christmas is about as long as conceptual they conceptualize a part, and that's even at one. When is it again? <laughs> is it really that far away? So monitoring performance, however you do that, through graphs, anything else. So if I, you know, Clemson, you know, all my teacher candidates, it's football there. So everything's moved the thing along a gridiron or whatever else. Anything, whatever their buy-in is, the personal thing. I've seen for bigs, I don't know if it's out here, hunting big? Whatever, okay, yeah, deer hunting or whatever else, you know, elk or whatever else that you want to put on there. Anything the kid buys into, there's somewhere they consistently track it there. Parent conferences there. I can't emphasize enough, if you want behavior to generalize, you've got to get buy-in from the parents. Now, where's my elementary people? Raise your hands, elementary. Life's good, isn't it? Life's pretty good. You know, you have parent-teacher night. You have a pretty good show, don't you? What, what's your first name, was, sir? Well, how many people, what percentage do you think show? 80. That's rock star. Where's my high school? If you got 80%, first name, sir? Sam. Sam. If you got 80%, would that be a record? Oh, yeah. What, what's the average level that you get on the thing? 1%. You know, in other words, you guys are playing poker in the back waiting for a parent to come in or whatever else to go. <laughs> so understand, that's a natural thing as the kids age through the system there is like parent participation. So what can you do? What can we provide to the parents to engage them to get them in the door? Show them how. What's, what is going to be worth it for me to come in? Is there any types of training that you could provide? 
Okay, so some type of training that you think would benefit the parents or whatever to get them engaged and to come in. It just can't be a traditional come in and talk to your teacher or whatever else. Like, well, I talk to them when I pick my son up or whatever it may be. So you have to put your thinking caps on. And again, every district, every school is going to be a little bit different. But providing training to them is a great way to get them in. Something to get them inside the door there. Something that's going to engage them. Okay? With college, it's easy. It's pizza, man. I can get every kid on campus by buying pizza. <laughs> But again, how do you engage them? Precision commands. This is huge, especially for ADHD and for autism population there. Did studies on this one with alpha versus beta commands. We tend, we're advanced communicators, we tend to talk in beta commands. I run a couple of adaptive sports programs for baseball and, and soccer. And so they go, the kids, you know, the buddies would go up, they paired one-on-one -on -one with young athletes with individual disabilities. They're like, okay, all right, Lauren, you're up next. What we need to do is we need to get your, your batting helmet on and then we're gonna go get the thing. An eight-year-old autism, what did he hear? <laughs> yeah, exactly. He heard the Charlie Brown. Wah, 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 wah. He saw the butterfly behind you. You gave like too much information in regards to that, okay? So similar, like if you ever stop for ask for directions, like, well, you go to the old church and then you go there. In other words, is it keep it as simple as possible. So given the command is, you're up next, get your back. Keep it simple. Keep it tight. When that's complied with that, then give the next command. Okay, so when you're dealing with ID, with autism, these are things that even that kid's in the life program, 23, 25 years old, keep it simple. If you give too many commands at one time, they're going to blow it off because they don't understand. And the, the thing is, socially, the kids as they age, they know how to blend in. And every, you can take any one of my life students and give them directions or whatever else, and every one of them will go up to you and convince you that they know exactly what they're going to do. Yep, got it because they know that's a socially acceptable response to give to somebody, okay? But then you break them down and you go, okay, so explain to me, what are you gonna do? They have no clue, okay? So just so, and this is a huge thing. Now that we have a lot of our kids with disabilities being included in the gen ed environment, many gen ed teachers don't know this. And they go, well, the kid that told me, he knew exactly what to do, okay? Well, did you follow up on that with a response? Because if he's with ID, I guarantee you, he or she probably does not. And they're just very good at social cues at knowing what they, you want to hear as the teacher. They're going to give the response. All right. Rules. Keep it simple. Okay? Kiss method. Keep it as simple as possible. I've been in schools where teachers didn't know the rules. There's no way. They're, it's like the IRS tax code book or whatever else. Can anybody do their taxes here? Now, the, the, the tax code book is this big. Keep it as simple as possible and keep it as socially as possible. In other words, is, and don't put them negative. If you can do it positive, so rather than don't sue them, be safe, be respectful, or whatever you want to do, but keep it simple. Something that can generalize across environments. Because be safe, and then I'll teach what be safe means in my classroom. Because you're allowed to run, but when we're in the recess area, running is not safe in the classroom there, okay? You can, you can slap, tag, whatever you want to do, and the recess, you can't do it in the cafeteria, okay? So you have to teach what is acceptable, what isn't acceptable. But don't come up with 5,000 rules as you're not allowed to do this in this specific area because, again, is you're going to end up with the IRS tax code book. And there's nobody who's going to know the rules or follow them unless who hadn't went to the schools that, in detention, you ended up writing the rule book or whatever else. And in my high school, it was like this big of a book or whatever else. It was like section five, okay, what, what can we not do in the stairwells? So keep it positive, keep it simple, be safe, be respectful, and then you can teach it and modify it. The beauty of this is when you're all using the same terminology, okay, if you adopt it as a school, be safe could be different in different environments and everything else is, but when I see somebody, even if he's not my student, I can lock that student up in a second by saying, hey, are you being safe? Because he knows the terminology. If you use a terminology that's only used in Miss what, Haley? Oh, Miss Haley's classroom or whatever else, I don't, Miss Haley's not my teacher, I don't know him or whatever else, and the kid goes whizzing by you because you use a terminology he or she's not familiar with. So be, using consistent terminology is much more better to see the behaviors generalize across your school environment. Staff training, I can't emphasize this one enough there, is getting all staff on board. And this is challenging because people don't like change. Okay? If I've been doing something the same way for 20 years, getting me to change is brutally painful. Okay. If you've been golfing, how many people here have ever golfed? How many here are bad golfers because you do golf? So if you take lessons and the pro tries to train your backswing or anything else, is it easy? No, it's not. And you have to understand that if you're trying to change a person, a, 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 
you know, teacher's been in there for 20 years, her behavior management strategy, he or she may be a little bit resistant to change, okay? So again is, but you have to provide the training and the support necessary for them to do it. Because if you just do a one day training, and schools will do this, they'll, they'll bring me out and you know, school district, go train our teachers. And if it's a one-shot deal, maybe a handful of teachers will incorporate it, but I guarantee you, more than likely, most people will go, well, that was very entertaining. And then they go on with exactly the same thing. So if you were doing a golf swing, well, that's a very interesting way to do that. And then you go back to your same golf swing again. So you have to redo recurrent trainings throughout there, okay? Structured daily schedule. I can't emphasize this one enough there is. Have the schedule built up. When are we most fresh? In the morning. What's some of the more demanding subject matters that we do in the morning? Math, right, something more challenging there. If I can get up and navigate around maybe life and you go, okay, let's go out, go collect five different types of leaves outside or whatever else. We're gonna talk about veins and leaves or whatever else and the thing is, now in the afternoon, you, you, the kid can more group activity. So how the schedule is done, okay? Make sure, my recommendation is always have the carrot. Okay, have something that he or she wants to. Don't go math, writing. Like, oh gee, I can't wait to get done with math so I go right into writing. You know, in other words, there's gotta be some motivator, the recess or whatever else it may be. Something that he or she is engaging. So split it up so it is as hard, easy, hard, easy going throughout the day. And there's just an example of a day. And again, I realize it does get more difficult as you go to A, B. Some schools may use A days, B days or whatever else and you change your entire schedule throughout that. Active supervision. This is important for teachers, okay? And I don't care if you've been at your first year or your last year there. Where did I meet most of you here? At the door, okay? We'll talk about cycle of regression tomorrow there. I meet my students all the time. Hey, how's it going? Oh, fine. I don't, fine, fine. How's it going there? And then I go to Christy. Hey, how's it going, Christy? And she walks by me. I know automatically something happened that she's already going up on the cycle of aggression. So I may, all it takes them to begin to learn is maybe just giving attention for a second, let me get everybody settled and we'll talk or whatever else or have the paraprofessional talk can de-escalate a problem behavior from ever occurring in my classroom there. But greet them at the door because you want to see them when they're first coming in. The other thing is, is do you think they're going to start fights or anything in your classroom? No, they're too smart for that when they get older is they know exactly where they can do that in unsupervised areas, in the hallways, in the staircase. So if I have staff at the doorway, monitoring the hallways and everything else, basically being like lifeguards checking there, you're going to have much less problems in your school. Okay, so active supervision. Now, if I go to elementary school, this is what I love seeing in elementary school is because again, it's, I've been there, okay, and I was like, what, one of the only three guys in a whole school or whatever else, and so you're seeking out, Steve, did you say, how you going? You know, like, <laughs> what happens when I look at a playground? Where do I see all the teachers? Yeah, I see them huddled like it's a football thing, right? and they're ready, ready to go to scrimmage or whatever else is like, and that's fine. I understand you want adult conversation to talk to after you've been, in, especially for the younger age groups there. But again, do it like the police do it. How do you see when you see two police cars? Yeah, you're facing the opposite direction. I can still talk. We can still talk. Hey, did you see the movie? It was a great movie, whatever. But I'm scanning this way. You're scanning that way. It's still active supervision. And you get to hang out with your friends. You just can't, oh, I don't want to see all the teachers lined up here. I'm here going back and forth there. But teach different areas. Because I've seen too often time, what happens is Roxanne comes in. It was like, oh, I got in a fight. Whatever he's picking on me. Yeah, you can go back. Go, don't worry about it. He, he just Go play somewhere else and leave him alone. Because there's whole areas of the playground which are unsupervised because all the adults are hanging by with themselves together in one area there. So active supervision. Minimize transitions. This is a biggie for, I, I've seen this even in higher ed. I've, I've seen this painfully when I've monitored other professors teach or whatever else. We've gotten them for an hour and 15 minutes and they waste 15 minutes. Sandy, Sandy, Bobby, Bobby. You know. I've seen that so many times, all the way even to the university level, it's ridiculous. I mean, you have them for such a limited amount of time to do this, don't waste time. So if you're doing this, put up a math problem on the smart board or whatever else, or word problems as they come, especially special education, because we get them at all times, especially resource, you know, because you're gonna come in five minutes after you come in or whatever else, and then you go through this whole high, I gotta get my bag down or whatever. So have the routine that once you get in, you get to work the problems up on the board or whatever, you grab your folder, but have some natural transition period for them to go to because that's when most of the problem behavior is occurring. The teacher runs behind the desk trying to get the next become from a reading teacher to a math teacher and it takes her five or ten minutes or whatever. Have an activity or something to do the transition smoothly there. All right, peer tutoring. I can't emphasize this enough. 
Okay? This is one of the most evidence-based interventions that there are. Much more effective than teacher-mediated. But if I go into everybody's classrooms here, what am I most likely going to see in everybody's class? The teacher in front teaching away. Okay? Much less effective than the peers teaching themselves. Okay? Peer made instruction is much more. The key is, is you have to teach how to do it. Okay? So you have to role play and basically just for, and build upon small periods of time where you become a tutor, 2D, you swap it out or whatever else, and you show them how to do it. If you just break the classroom up and you go, okay, we're all going to peer tutor today, or whatever, for a half hour, it's going to be pure chaos. Okay? Which I think what happens is scares off many things. But the evidence is clear, clear as a bell. Much more effective than teacher media instruction. Much more effective than self media instruction. Teacher and peer media is the most effective ac academic intervention out there. Okay, so make sure you're including it at least on a regular basis, once a week, once a day for a period of time, or whatever else. Is. Because again, is think of opportunities to respond. We call it OTRs. How many times, as a, do you have a class of 20 or 40, does a kid get to, to talk to you? 10 seconds out of a whole period, if they're lucky. Maybe if you're really talkative, maybe three times. How many times do you get to talk during peer media instruction? It's like half the class? Which are you going to learn more? Okay, with your hands getting dirty on something, working with it, or just sitting there like a lab? I can't do that, my apologies. Or sitting there like a lab, just looking at the person going, uh-huh, that's a wonderful statement. Thank you, you're a great teacher. Okay, the more they engage, the more they're going to learn. So you have to make sure peer media instruction is being utilized. And there's a host of things. I use a lot as cross-age peer tutoring. I love this as ED. Because my kids were reading at, even in high school, third grade level. But you know what? If you, you gotta, who could they coach? Who could they teach? Yes, you bring them down and they love that. And that was their reward. So if you hit your points or whatever else, you get to go down to Mrs. Smith's kindergarten, first grade or whatever, and you teach phonemic awareness, okay? Does that make sense? You teach sight words. But so it works great. I have kids behave so much because again, is what do you think it does to their self-confidence? Because all their life, they thought they were stupid. Everybody else is reading this, I can't read this or whatever else, and now I'm teaching somebody else a skill set. It builds up their self-esteem tremendously there. So again, I can't, I can't beat the drum hard enough on peer tutoring. If you're not including that, you really need to consider again is how do I incorporate this into my class? But again, you have to teach them how to do it. Okay? And if you're not confident, my recommendation is reach out to another teacher who includes it and have her show. Maybe watch in her classroom or his classroom and then have them engage into your classroom to, to teach that. But well worth. Again, other different uh, teacher media interventions that have proven effective there. And again, I'm not going to do all these, you know, sequential prompting, previewing. And again, this is just, again, mnemonic instruction. Mnemonics work great. I love them. <laughs> Especially if you don't have a great memory. Next thing we're going to talk about is positive intervention procedures there. So what we're going to talk about is everything from behavior contracts, behavioral momentum, chaining, all the way through the tracking there. Okay, behavior contracts. Use these constantly. Because the question that always comes up is like, well, but it's not fair. Why does Sarah have it and Kira doesn't or whatever else is? Well, because they have different needs, okay? And they don't want to work for the same thing. So you find a contract because, again, you may be is homework completion. You may be, you know, p instigating peers or whatever else. Everybody has a different behavior that we're trying to improve, okay? So behavior contract, though, is, again, write it out with them and make sure it's not just your contract that you want, you know, Steve to do. It's basically something, an agreement between Steve and the teacher of what he's to accomplish. And then what does he get afterwards there? The biggie with ED kids and behavior contracts is you need to honor them. And this I've had a lot of issues with. Because it may be, and Steve, pick any behavior, any behavior at all that we've made agreement on. Your yeah, blurting out in class. Blurting out in class. And Steve has done an amazing job. And again, he hit his numbers and everything else, and it's Friday, and his thing was recess, extra recess time. But you know what? Steve's ED. Does, do you think there's other behaviors that are concerned with Steve? Mm, yeah. Yeah. And Steve gets in a fight Friday morning. And what do you think the teacher does? Takes, recess. Takes away the recess. You just lost. You broke all confidence with Steve ever making an agreement with you again. Because right. what was the contract for? Blurting out. And if he complies that, now there will be a consequence for fighting, okay? But you need to honor the contract that you made with him for that, okay? Because one is completely unrelated to the other, okay? And if you don't honor that contract that he worked so hard for there, he's never going to buy into your agreements again because he knows you lie, okay? 
And again, I like this one. Can't sign unless my attorney reviews it. All right, behavioral momentum. This is the most important one of all, of the whole session. If you learn nothing else, learn this. How many here have difficulties getting kids to get started working? Every rape, raise your hand. If you're lying, <laughs> you're just lying. I mean, how, how many here have problems having their child do something that they want? <laughs> raise your hand, every single person. <laughs> Even if you don't have a child yet, you're going to have problems. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Behavioral momentum is one of the most important concepts ever. They teach it in sales, left and right. There would be no salesperson in the world, man or woman, existing, be able to support themselves if they didn't use this concept. Okay? You come in, how many, anybody buy a new car yet recently? Somebody had to buy a new car. What kind of car did you buy? Well, we're buying a minivan, but my husband sells them. This is, this is. This, okay, all right, well, we, go with me. So, okay, and your first name is? And your first name is? Julie. Julie. All right, so beautiful name. Okay, so Julie comes in, she's looking for a new car. So she comes in, and I'm brand new on, on your husband's lot there. So you come in, you go, Joe, I'm interested in a car. <laughs> and so she's looking at, what are you interested in buying? A minivan. What kind? Any, any particular brand? or Chrysler. Chrysler minivan, okay? There, there is no better one, okay? Sure. So in other words, so she comes in, do I go, okay, it's $25,000. Can you want to go into the office now and sign? Is that the first question out of my mouth? No. No, because that is a what? Low probability request. Okay, a salesman would never ever do. They'd be they'd be reprimanded in a second by the manager. The first thing they would question would be something kind of like, "Oh, do you think it's a pretty car?" Something simple. I want her head doing this. I want behavior momentum doing this. And she goes, "Oh, are you in the mood? Are you in the mood or whatever? A mood for a new car or whatever? Need for a new car, whatever it may be. I want her going. Yes, 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 yes. And I go, "Oh, do you like the heated seats? You know." Not today, though, but Indiana does have cold winters, don't they? Mm -hmm. you know, wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be nice to have heated leather seats and everything else? And you, you like Sirius Radio? It comes to Sirius Radio for six months free. Isn't that pretty nice? Look at that head. Like, oh. And again, what we're looking at is can you afford like 350 a month or whatever else is? Now that's the low probability request. Teachers don't incorporate this at all. Teachers start off and end with a low probability request. Do you want to buy this car? Math book, 235, every odd problem, go. Yeah. Yeah. What the <laughs> hell? All right, let's see if you're also guilty mom and dads. First name, sir? Charles. Charles, go clean your room. <laughs> What's the likelihood that when I come back, Charles has got his room cleaned up? Or that she's done every odd math problem going on in her book? 0 0.001 or whatever probability there. Sales would never do this. High probability was, hey, do you have a math book with you? Yeah. Oh, great, awesome. Can you do me a favor? Can you get it out for a second? Sure. High probability, I'm getting compliance. Can you do me a favor? Can you open up page 235? Mm. Right. Here, let me help you. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm going for compliance. Once I have compliance, the likelihood that non-compliance is coming gets reduced every time, okay? And if I can get three or four compliance things in a routine, remember step one, remember, it's long division. Remember that not dead monkeys smell bad. Divide, multiply, subtract, bring down. Can you do the first thing here? Good job. I'll be back after you do that one, but we're going to be doing the odd problems there. That's the low probability request. Okay? Nobody was step on to a car sales and hear that, are you ready to pay $350 a month or whatever else? <laughs> you're running away. You're going to the next car. Even if you didn't like the next car dealer, you're going to buy there rather than that place. Okay? For the home, clean the room. No, he's still watching TV. He's watching the football game or whatever else is. Hey, can you do me a favor? Can you come here for a second? Oh, great. Can you do me a favor? Can you get the laundry basket? Oh, great. Can you do me a favor? Can you pick up high probability request once he's in action? Great job. I gotta go, I'm going to put the laundry in the basket. When I come back, I hope to make the, uh, the beds made or whatever else, and then you can watch the football game, okay? High probability, high probability, then low probability after you get compliance, okay? Don't be shocked when the kids are not complying with teachers when you get art opened up with a low probability request. You would never have made a sales, and you're more than likely not going to have the kids comply in math or whatever, especially when you're dealing with kids with emotional disturbance, learning disabilities, or ideas. So don't be shocked when they don't comply with that. High probability request, and especially if you have the kids with the hoodies that come up and the head goes down is, Try those high probability requests first. Behavioral momentum is a great concept, and again, is it's used in, in the sales field continuously, okay, with tremendous success. 
but we just, for whatever reason, don't teach this at all. It's just kind of, and we'll talk about all the concepts that we don't do. But behavioral momentum, highly recommend using it. This is the second one that I highly recommend. Chaining, okay? Now you guys, like 80% of you are special educators, raise your hands. You're really familiar with task analysis, so you're not. You could do that in your sleep. You could break down any task at all. Go, okay, I'm gonna put on the shirt. And I'm going to do this in seven steps. But based on his IQ, I may make it 14 steps. I may make it two steps or whatever it may be. We always teach using forward chaining. Okay? And I teach applied behavior analysis to teachers that have been in the field, bless you, to like you know, 15, 20 years. And they teach everything to forward chaining. Step one, you complete step one, they go to step two. You complete step two, we go to step three. Math teachers, do we not do that? Dead monkeys smell bad. Divide, multiply, subtract, bring down. What's the problem with forward chaining? You have to do the first thing in order to do the next. You have to do that. And what happens when I'm not able to do the next? Frustration. Oh, I teach to the point of failure. Is there a population that we know that does not like failing? Autism. Ooh, children with autism. What happens when they reach the point of failure? Frustration, yes, okay? And so now picture in your mind there, what does your typical student with autism look like? See if you can, see if I describe it pretty well. Slip on shoes, sweatpants, t-shirt or something else that they slip over or whatever else. Basically little disheveled people, are they not? Why is that? Parents have the same thing at home. Be a brave soul, come on up. So task analysis for getting dressed, okay? Mm -hmm. You don't see them in button shirts or whatever else, button downs or anything else there. Mm -hmm. So can you do me fair, can, can you help Steve? Can you help? Sure. sure. <laughs> Be a brave soul. And then we'll take a cookie break. <laughs> <Let's see. coughs> so how would, how would you teach that to me? How, how would you brace this task analysis down to me? Okay. You have to turn the coat around. Am I putting this you're going to be the assistant. You're power, so no, you're going to be the power for me. So oh, you're teaching okay. me. Turn, turn the coat around. <laughs> turn it back around. <laughs> I did turn around. Back the other way. <laughs> um, look at it so you can see the inside of the coat. Hey. <laughs> um, Flip it back over. I don't want to play this game anymore! <laughs> now what happens, is, is it just, is it gone in five minutes? Is my whole episode going to be gone? No. Pretty much that instruction was gone for that day, was it not? So we come back on Tuesday now. And we're going to try it again. Here you go, sir. Mr. Steve? Mr. Keith, come on. You're doing great. Um, can we model it? Okay, you can model it. You can do whatever you want, but you got to still get it on me, do you not? Yep. Okay. Because this is forward chaining. And so I'm going to master it to the point after a week, it's now Friday, and I've had four episodes, but I now understand that it's this concept is how I'm going to turn it on. Mm -hmm. Next step. That was fun. <laughs> um, put your left arm through the left hole. <laughs> and I would have another meltdown because you told me I was wrong. Thank you, Jim. Very, thank you very much. So what happens here is parents do this at home. And every morning, because the parent also has to go to work. work. And this episode doesn't last five minutes, does it? It ruins the entire morning. And they come and they tell you that Joey's having a bad day and anticipate or whatever else goes in. How many times do you think this is going to occur before they go, we're not going to do this anymore? How many here have had parents tell them, I don't care what you do in the classroom. Do not upset my child. That is the major goal. Don't be, be proud. Raise a hand. I mean, basically, they want you as a babysitter. Is that our job? No. Our job is to get them independent living and functioning society there, okay? But that's the issue is teaching with forward chaining because you're always teaching to the point of failure. And once they fail, the whole day or the morning is shot. How do we respond to this? Do we just stop and watch the kid go through the rest of his life with sweatpants or whatever and slip on shoes? No, give him a way to succeed. What is that way to succeed? Backward chaining. So what we do is... We do every step until the last thing, and it may be just, you know, 
the last button or whatever else of a shirt or whatever else they're tucking it. And when he's mastered that, then he goes to the last thing with assistance to that last step. And we reverse it. Rather than going from 1 to 10, we go from 10 to 1. Does that make sense? And once you're confident that he's mastered 10, and only then do we go to 9. And then once he's mastered 10 and 9, and only then do we go to 8. Does that make sense? And you will see much fewer outbursts with your students with autism. And I tell you know, teachers who've taught students with autism, I go, do you understand you've been spooling up your students? for the So understanding the importance of backward chaining. So forward chaining is a traditional way that we've taught everything since we've ever learned, math and everything else is, you need to make sure they incorporate, especially if you deal with autism, is backward chaining. Because they're not teaching the point of frustration, they're going to succeed much more. Okay? Differential, well, we've got a little bit more time before the cookie break here. Differential reinforcement. The goal here is to reinforce the pro-social behavior while pulling the reinforcement away from the maladaptive behavior. And so there's going to be several different ways that we're going to be talking about this. Okay. The first thing, when I want a replacement behavior, I'm going to look for something that is incompatible with the maladaptive behavior. So if it's a child with autism who bites and self-injurious behavior, I want to give him an outlet where he cannot do the same thing. Does that make sense? So before you just pick a replacement behavior, try to see, and you can't, it's not always possible, but try to identify a behavior that if he or she's doing this behavior, they cannot do the other behavior. Does that make sense? That's a differential reinforcement, incompatible behavior. That's my goal. Unfortunately, that's not always possible. Okay? If it's not possible, then I'm going to look for just an alternative, more pro-social behavior. Okay? So rather than screaming out, raising the hand. But it's not incompatible because everybody knows, and everybody's had a student that raises the hand and screams out, Julie, you know, whatever, Julie, that's good. It was like, but understand that concept, okay? So incompatible first. If you can't do that, then find one that's just more pro-socially alternative behavior there. And again, I gave every one of these because again, in a week or two, you're going to, what the heck was he talking about that? So I have examples on each slide there, so it hopefully it'll make a little bit more logical sense later on when you're looking at that. But I'm not going to read out a paragraph for each one. That's for you for later on. To reference. Sometimes it's a pro-social behavior the child does not display at all. Okay? So in other words, Roxanne doesn't want to pick on her anymore. She's flipped her name tag. <laughs> Sometimes it's just, <laughs> it's just maybe they don't say the please, the nice, the thank you. Sometimes so I want to reinforce that. So what I want to do is reinforce a higher rate of behavior there. Maybe he does not raise. How many students do not? They never participate. To be in class, they are not once will they participate in the class. So we have a behavior contract to increase the number of times he or she participates in the classroom. That's a differential reinforcement of higher. Maladaptive behavior, we're trying to get to lower. Okay, so I'm going to reinforce it anytime he displays something that's lower. Higher is if you say, please, I see you do it two times, you get a reward, reinforced. If it's five times in the next week, you keep raising it to its normal level of the social peers. If you're cussing or whatever else or hitting, it's got to obviously come down to a different reinforcement of lower behavior. And this is where a lot of teachers have issues with. You have Joey, Bridget? Yes, I have Joey. And, and, and <laughs> what's that? <laughs> oh, you have, you have your student, Julia. Okay. So you have Julia. What, what behavior is it? Okay. Physical aggression. Oh, physical aggression. Okay. So how about spitting? Let's pick spitting. Spitting's spitting a good one. I, that was the one I always hated. I always hated spitting. So again is she spits on an average. We collect baseline data and she spits at you about five times a day. So she comes to me and she goes, Joe, we, we, need, we need to cut this down. Okay. It's just kind of like this whole health hazard thing. Just not really, not really working for me. The whole germ thing going, you know, a little germaphobe here. Not really loving this there. So I go, great. So now I want you to reinforce Julia for only spitting at you four times next week. Okay. What are most teachers going to say to me? There's a lot of four-letter words that can come to your mind right now, right, isn't it? Yeah, there's no way in heck. Because, but I'm going to tell you as a behavior specialist, you're never going to change your behavior from high to zero overnight. It's not going to happen. The same is the child who's participating in class, if I want to hand raising, I'm never going to go from zero to 10 overnight. I'm going to shape the behavior over time. So how do I do this now? So, so talk, to you, talk to your buddies and try to figure out is because I know that the only way possible to get Julia to spitting down is five to four to three to two to one because that's a normal shaping of 
behavior. But she ain't playing. How do we do this? Talk amongst yourselves. There's one, there's one answer to this there. Kind of that Einstein realm here again. How do, how do we figure it out? What solutions did you come up? Anybody? Because I, I, you know behavior is going to shape. And she's going, absolutely not. I'm not going to reinforce this kid for spitting at me four times and then three times and then two times. Never going to happen, Joe. But I'm telling her that the only way it's going to change, differential reinforcement of other. Think of it as zero. So it's five times that she spit on in six hours. So basically once every hour. So if I go, would you be willing to reinforce Julia for if she goes an hour and a half without spinning at you to reinforce her? Yeah, ah, and then what do we do next week? Two hours, three hours. Do you see, understand? We're still shaping behavior, but it's smoke and mirrors. There's no teacher in the world that's gonna say, I'm willingly gonna reinforce her at the end of the day. Like, yeah, yeah let me get the little slime out of here. But there was only four times today. That was much better, Joe. It's like, <laughs> not gonna happen. But if you're reinforcing only for those pro-social times when she did not do that, you're still doing, you're still shaping. But in then, if I plotted the number of times that she got spit at, it's still the exact same thing. Do you see what I'm saying is? So it's have differential reinforcement of zero or other behaviors, okay? And with that, now that I got boogers all over in your mind, go ahead and have a cookie now. Go ahead. <laughs> all right, let's go ahead and uh, get seated again. So the most important concept of all was what now? Oh, uh, behavioral momentum. <laughs> Always start out with a what, what type of request? High probability. High probability. You want three high probabilities before you go to that low probability there. If you're working with autism though, what's the most important concept so far? Backward, backward chaining there, okay? So in other words, make sure we're not doing, just doing forward chaining as we're incorporating backward chaining there. So I'm um, getting replacement behaviors. The first thing I want to do is find a behavior that is incompatible, okay? If I can't find one that's incompatible, then I'm going to be looking for one that's just an alternative replacement <coughs> behavior. Sometimes I want a pro-social behavior to increase, higher rates of behavior. Sometimes, most of the time, the majority of the time, it's a maladaptive behavior we're trying to reduce, okay? Differential reinforcement will lower. But sometimes, is if it's especially dealing with aggression, physical aggression, teacher's not going to be compliant with this whole shifting of behavior idea or whatever else is. So we're going to go with differential reinforcement of zero or other behaviors, okay? So in other words, re reinforce it for the time that the behavior is not being performed, okay? All right. And then for young children, again, is uh, for nonverbal, is DRC, is differential reinforcement or communicative behaviors like PECs and everything else, is you're trying to teach a replacement behavior if they're displaying aggressive, a more effective way to communicate. So those of your early childhood. All right, direct instruction, very evidence-based, providing detailed instruction. As special educators, I'm not going to beat this one to death because you could probably hold a better instruction on it than I can on this one for the academic folks in here. But again, Fading of prompts. This is huge is how to pull back prompts so they can provide the independent thing. So in other words, is the gradual elimination of cues and prompts for that. And let's go into graduated guidance. In other words, I'm going to explain this in more detail in a second here. Is basically is coming back, like I teach adaptive sports or whatever else. And so teaching a kid with autism how to prop proper stance and everything else. Okay, if I, so I say widen your stance. But graduate guidance, he's not going to understand basically, so we may have to do, okay, open up the stance, we'll try modeling or whatever else, and, but there may be a point where I actually have to move the leg or whatever else, and we'll scoot out the person's legs or whatever to that position there. So can we do it less and less? Group reinforcement, I kind of out of place. Okay, we'll come back to, to prompts again in a second there, but group reinforcement, this is pure, pure pressure, okay, and how we can use this, this is a good one there. Okay, group reinforcement, how do we use peer pressure to do things? Three different types, dependent, independent, interdependent, okay. Dependent is the performance of one person, okay, one or more particular members determines the consequence of the entire group. So if Roxanne has never turned in her writing assignment, okay, the, the consequence is basically is if we can get her to do it, we can all have more recess time, okay. What does that do? 
Yeah. There you go. That's the cautionary thing with it. So you want to make sure, A, first of all, it's not a skill deficit, but it's a performance deficit. And B, that you want to make sure that she's not going to try to sabotage it. Because what you did is I may have taken a person who may have already been alienated from the class and made sure that she was alienated by everybody. Because if I offer a reward system, isn't it almost like a promise, a guarantee that they're going to, and if it doesn't go, it's all your fault. So in other words, so be careful of that, but you can, in other words, if somebody has the capacity to just perform a steps they're not is, and they aren't on friendly terms with their peers, it's a good way to have their peers help perform to increase performance there. So that's dependent. Independent is, again, each group member receives a consequent if they meet it. That's the way the majority of people do it. So if we're going out, Steve, uh, I'm his paraprofessional, and Steve goes, okay, whoever does the writing assignment, Mr. Joe will be outside, you're doing the thing, go ahead and you have time. So Julie finishes, go outside to Joe or whatever and play kickball or whatever else. So, and if you decide, you know, if Chelsea decides not to do it, well, she stays in the classroom there. The problem with that is it doesn't utilize peer influence there, okay? So that's the problem with that, but it's most commonly used there. And interdependent is a good one also is basically everybody has to do it to get the group reward. And this is commonly used on field trips and stuff. So in other words, I want you guys to do hand in in the springtime your science report. And if we do that, we'll take a trip to the zoo. Okay, but everybody's got to do it. Now, have a backup plan, contingency plan that if Steve and Joe don't do it and go, I don't want to care, I don't care about that, they go on a behavior contract, but everybody else is on the contingency. Does that make sense? Because you may have some people who try to sabotage it. But those are nice ways to get peer pressure to help produce and uh, uh, productivity for the students there. Modeling, okay, for another thing, modeling is huge. Super Bowl, what happens in school the day after the Super Bowl? What is every kid doing? Wearing their football jerseys. Football jerseys, are they also not all playing football or whatever, throwing out, why? Because it was modeled for them, they, modeling is extremely important there, okay? We use this a lot, okay? We use this in the life program, we have mentors, okay? So we have traditional college students, we assign one-on-one -on -one mentors to our students. We had one student, because again, is kids aren't going to listen to you because you're not cool anymore, okay? You're, you're an old person. You're a teacher, okay? We can teach. We can say things 100,000 times. We had one student who was great. It was, I called her the bag lady. Nicest bags ever. Vera Bradley or whatever else. She would come, but she, every position she owned, she would come to school every single day with it. And no matter how many times the instructors and everybody said, you can't do this again, it doesn't affect. So we talked to her mentor, who's somebody who she looks up to, you know, whatever else. There's a sophomore, you know. Delta, 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 whatever else, you know, everybody was like, oh, we need to change this behavior. So she brought it to lunch with her friends, and all her friends would go, oh, we would never do that. No, that's just not cool. What do you think she came to school with the next day? Her little purse, and that was it. Okay, so in other words, it's modeling, but again, understand who the model is. Just because you're the teacher, don't think that you're important in their lives, because we're not, okay? <laughs> we have very limited influences. It's, it's the captain of the football team, the head of the cheerleader, whatever else is. So that's why cross-age works really good in regards to that. Having other people come down and influence that. Think of teen magazines or whatever else, 16 or whatever else. is well, Who are they made for? 14-year-olds or whatever else is to look up to. So modeling is incredibly important. Yeah. Observational learning there, again, observing from modeling there, other steps, the procedures there. Again, special ed teachers, I'm not going to beat these to death there. And then a participant model. Many times, I, again, not only am I not the cool person as a teacher, I can't see what's really going on. When Sarah's out with her friends in recess, because most of the behavior is instigation, she's not doing it in front of me. She's doing it in front of her peers. Okay? So what I need to know is, I didn't have intelligence of what, what she's doing there. Is she actually trying, you know, if we're doing skill streaming, is she actually trying to implement the intervention we're trying? Or is she blowing me off? Is she instigating others? So I need what's called a confederate. And this is what I love, coming from New York City and teaching in South Carolina for 11 years. <laughs> Not one year have they ever known the definition of confederate. And I ask, I go, what is a confederate? And they'll go, somebody who's fought on the rebel side? I'm like, no. <laughs> confederate is somebody who's sympathetic to the cause. Okay, so I want somebody who is Chelsea or whatever else, and the, the key is the Confederate can't give it away. So when Sarah's out playing or whatever else, is she trying this, you know, intervention or whatever else, or is she swearing, instigating others? Does that make sense? That's the only way you're truly going to get information on what's going on, and that comes through the Confederate. Okay, so that helps again. Parent training, and we use that for our mentors, basically, they give feedback on our life students is, are they trying this? Are they being socially integrated? Are they trying? Are they not? Parent training, I can't emphasize this enough. If you want behaviors to generalize, you need to engage the parent. Education is the three-legged stool, the child, the teacher, and 
the parents. If we don't get involved in the thing, if we said 80% buy-in from the elementary level, 1%, 2% from the high school level, whatever it may be, is you need to have buy-in. Behavior doesn't generalize unless it happens. And this is the problem with special ed teachers is because the kids discriminate. They know that in Miss Roxanne's class, this is what I do. This is the behavior management. And then I go to my traditional gen ed teacher, Mr. Steve in math, and guess what? I act very differently. And I just, the kids will discriminate between environments that they go. This is why having all people on the same behavior management plan, the concept, is so critically important. I also need mom and dad because other than that is the kid's going to behave one way in school and then the minute he leaves school or she leaves school doors, guess what? The other behaviors are going to revert. Okay? So you have to have mom and dad above it. Now this gets complicated. Okay? How, do you, how do you invite yourselves into the families and everything else? School counselors, you may be a little more comfortable with that. Most special ed teachers are not that comfortable in getting, and I get involved a lot because I'm a guardian, I lie to them and everything, so I get involved a lot with families who are very dysfunctional in behavior management there. Barkley and Patterson training videos I would highly recommend. This is basically the concepts of applied behavior analysis, what we do in schools, and we basically incorporate it basically into the parents. So it's basically, if you're having problems with the kids, they go through, they have families there, they show them problems with non-compliant children, they show them behavior strategies which is the exact same thing that we're doing in the school, or with ABA there, okay, and how to get buy-in. The nice thing is you don't have necessarily have to go into their room. I don't have to tell mom and dad what to do. Is basically I'm sharing them information. This is something that we incorporate here. It seems to be working well with your daughter. We thought maybe that you'd like to incorporate the same thing. Okay? And again, if you want the behavior generalized, you have to have mom and dad involved. Okay? Otherwise, it's the same thing as you'll see with administrators is the kid acts one way in one classroom, works a completely different way with another classroom. And you guys probably the same way. Who here had a favorite teacher you were awesome with? Now, was there a teacher that you were not the nicest student with? Yeah, just about everybody has the same thing. You discriminate between classrooms there, and the kids don't expect any difference from the kids. All right. Positive reinforcement there. Again, reinforce at a 5 to 1 ratio there. You want to reinforce behaviors that you want to see there. Okay, that's the key is. If I leave it alone, okay, don't be surprised when the behavior goes away because you're not reinforcing the child's behavior that you want to see. All right. Schedules of reinforcement. This is the key here. I don't want to go around the rest of your life and giving Lauren token economy bucks or whatever else or praise. That's not my job. Okay? And understand, this is where the difference between gen ed and special ed is. is They think we're going to be following this kid around their whole life or whatever all the time. That's not it. It's to get it into their repertoire of the behavior, and then we're going to pull it back and thin it out and fade it out. Okay? And this is an easy way to do this. It's basically the schedule reinforcements. Initially, we're going to do it continuously, and then we're going to thin the reinforcement to where he or she doesn't get it anymore. Okay? All right. So a continuous reinforcement. And this is all based on, again, applied behavior analysis. Think about how many here have a lab recently or anything else, dog that they're trained, and everything. Nobody has a dog. They're all cat people. Is that what it is you're telling me? <laughs> it's a whole audience of cat people. Oh, great. <laughs> Based essentially is when you first get a puppy or whatever else and you're trying to make them sit, what? You give him the treat, you give him the praise and everything else. Are you going to keep giving this lab a treat the rest of his life? You're going to have a 500 pound lab on your or whatever else. Like that. So in other words, eventually what's going to happen is you're going to pull the treat back and you're just going to give the praise. Okay? So basically that thinning process. But initially, to get buy-in, you want to reinforce every single behavior that is shaping the behavior. Okay? And it's not going to be perfect. So in other words, as Lauren is hand-raising. Lauren just blurts out. You've heard her like 15 times already today. I think. She's, been, she's been talking a lot, nonstop. So we're going to say the traditional teaching one is what? Finger on the lip, raise hand or whatever as a prompt to give her the thing. So we've talked about it and everything else. And so it comes up in math, and I do the thing. I go three divided by whatever, you know, and then Lauren, she's going to blurt it out because she knows the answer, right? I'm going to go like this. Even if Lauren's trying really, really hard, is she going to be perfect for the next day? Mr. Ryan, you know, whatever else is now. What you may see is the hand go up, and she's going to call out the answer. And we're going to go, remember, Lauren, okay? Wait till your response or whatever. The behavior is going to get shaped over time until eventually Lauren's going to learn to raise the hand and wait for the teacher's response there. So again, continuous reinforcement initially is every single time. So I give this thing, you know, congratulate, nice shot, nice shot. What happens the next time he does it? There you go. There's my... <laughs> it's a brutal crowd. It's a rough crowd after lunch. You give them a cookie and they don't even talk anymore. <laughs> All 
I should have held the cookies up here. You don't get the cookie until you answer. <laughs> All right, every single time, continuous reinforcement. You'll use your CRF there. Then I've got to wean him. So now, how do I wean this? How do I thin the reinforcement schedules there? I can do ratio, number of time, okay? So a fixed ratio of three. Every third time a student does something, he gets a reward. Reward. Good job, Steve. There's your cookie. <laughs> Now, the problem with this, it works great in elementary school. When I walked, taught high school, they figured it out in a heartbeat. If Mr. Ryan's not going to give you anything until another two answers or whatever. Don't even bother, whatever else. So Vegas figured this out for us. What does Vegas do? Mix it up. Mix it up. Does, does the slot machine pay off every 100th coin? Because you'd be back with me, 99. Okay, now tackle her and we'll put it in and get the money. Okay, in other words, you figure out. No, it's random. So it's a variable. So basically, on an average, you're going to reinforce the behavior every third time. But it could be two times in a row. Okay, but on an average, we don't know yet. We have no clue of when it's coming. That's the whole beauty of Vegas. That's why it's so addictive. Okay, they want it. The beauty of this is... It gives you time to go teach. I can't be going around giving bucks out every single time. So I got to teach and give model up here. And then while you guys are doing, now I'm giving bucks left and right. Okay, does that make sense? And then I got to retreat again, go work on the board, and then I can come back. But on average, I'm going to give every third. And then I'm going to thin it. The next week, I may go every fifth, every seventh. And then my high school students were like, hey. Yeah. You don't, you don't give me anything anymore for that. And I go, because you're doing so good or whatever else. Just like you wouldn't give the lab a treat every single time. You would thin it to the point where all he's doing is getting a good job. Okay? All right. Intervals, I could do it on time. So I could do the same thing as, so in other words, every one minute, every three minutes, every five minutes, and I would just use time as opposed to the, uh, the frequency of it occurs. Okay? Prompting. This is a huge one. Okay? Gestural, visual, auditory, and physical. This is really important to do, okay? And if we violate this, you'll know it really quickly. How many have gone up to, and Roxanne, I'm gonna use you just, okay? <laughs> How many people have gone up to help somebody with a math problem, and you've done this, and you got the elbow into the chest, or the hand flicked in the thing? I see a few hand things, because you violated the level of prompting, okay? Your kids will do this. How many kids, I got it, I can do this. Every parent, I don't want to get help, I can do it you violated the level of prompt that he or she required there. So what you want to do is the least intrusive prompt first. So we're driving down the road. First name is? Emily. Emily. So Emily's driving down the road with me, okay? And she was kind enough to give me a ride to the airport. And she's listening to her favorite song. Your favorite musician is? I'm going to pick one. Pick something. I'm going to pick and you're not going to like who I pick. <laughs> Pick four. Oh, Dave Matthews. Dave Matthews. See, I wouldn't have been that kind. I would, but Dave Matthews, and she's singing along to Dave Matthews going down, but she doesn't pay attention that the light is going from green ahead to yellow to red. I'm kind of looking, but she doesn't seem to be slowing down at all there. Is at that point that I just grab the wheel and throw myself on the brake or whatever else to slow the car down? Would that be appropriate? No. No, I violated <laughs> the level of prompts here. What would be the first thing? Gestural. I may kind of snap the fingers or whatever and point to light or whatever else there. And as we get closer to it, whatever else is, ooh, maybe I have time to get my iPhone out, take a picture of the red light and show it to her up front or whatever. I may not have time there. And then go auditory. I may say light, red light or whatever else. And if she's at that point, she's still jamming to Dave Matthews and not paying him and death is coming upon us. At that point, I may grab the steering wheel and jump on the brake. Does that make sense? When you go that same thing in academic instruction with Roxanne with her math, what I want to do is try to give a gestural prompt, bring down or whatever else, don't go into doing the task for the student, okay? So in other words, go to the point where they're going to fail at that point, they're not, they're lost, and then give the next one, okay? And to the point is, you gotta bring down the number or whatever else, or watch me do this. Does that make sense? So it's really important on this. This is also really important when teaching things, because I don't know how many times, where's my elementary? How many times have you seen a goal on an IEP that's never been off that IEP? Yep. <laughs> okay. So the kids in fourth grade, I've still got tie shoelaces or whatever else on the thing there, okay? Okay, now put me in the place there is, how do you calm me down as a parent 
when I think you're the worst teacher I've ever seen in my life because this, this IEP goal has been on there for four years. Why is this IEP goal? Are you that bad of a teacher that you can't teach us? You can't teach around the rabbit and through the trunk? Or how does it go again? Whatever, you know, they make the year and everything? How do, you, how do you determine that? Because your IP goal just says what? Joey has not made it. Joey cannot do that. How do you, how have you been determined progress? Through this. So you do the task analysis, and what can he do it? Can he do it independently? Can he do it with gestural? Can he do it with auditory? Can he do it with phys? Does that make sense? And there may be a point where after three years, is maybe his fine motor skills is one thing around the tree trunk or whatever else, he cannot do. And at that point, we go, let's get it off the IEP, and he is going to wear slip-on shoes at that point, or Velcro or whatever. Does that make sense? But it helps you determine either, A, maybe I need to break the task analysis down further, or not possible for this child. But I don't just leave an IEP goal on the thing for four years that hasn't changed or whatever else, and then people are just, you know, you know John Hancocking the thing for no reason at all. But prompting is very important. Okay, redirection, interrupting the things. Administrator, I don't think anybody does this better than administrators. I've never seen anybody administrate. They're just so good at redirecting kids all the time or whatever else. It's just, and then they move on or whatever else. But it's a good skill. It makes practice to do that, to, to redirect for the problem. Self-management. We talked about, uh, no, self-monitoring was the earlier uh, thing. Is Self-monitoring is a really good one because basically I don't want to follow him or her around. So what I do is with vibrating watches there. And if it's a person paying attention or whatever else is, basically it vibrates, it gives the message, and then they monitor, were they paying attention, were they not? I'm going to reinforce accuracy. Okay, so the first week or two, all I want you to do is I want you to accurately record whether you're on task or not, whether it be doing writing or penmanship or anything else. If you know this answer from the previous thing, don't answer it. Why would I not want to set for goals yet? Yes, I'm teaching her to lie. What I really want to do is, all I want to do is reward accuracy that she actually knows when she's on attention, when she's not. I'll have the same watch and we'll look and I go, good job, I agree with you, everything else. Even if it's zero, even if she's done 10%, that's fine. But it's now giving me a baseline of what her performance is and now I can set a goal for what's a realistic one. Because if we're shaping behavior, it's not going to go from 10 to 80 or whatever else. And if I set a goal like that's unrealistic is, she's not even going to try. So I have to set steps to shape her behavior there. Again, self-management, self-reinforcement there is a really important one there. And we do it really well, okay? Uh, you're college graduates. You do it exceptionally well. You did good in a test, what happens? You rewarded yourself. You do this, you reward yourself. Our kids don't know how to do that, okay? Because So reinforcement there and self-evaluation. Self-punishment, I'm not a big fan of. I love this guy, though. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what does he do? I have a video, but I won't show it there. But what, is, what does he do all the time? If you do something wrong, it's self-punishment. Our kids typically are hard enough on themselves, so I don't really encourage self-punishment, but it is, again, a strategy there for higher functioning. Self-instruction is huge, and again is, how many here are sports? Volley who, who coaches here? Anybody coach? What sport? Volleyball. Volleyball, okay. So volleyball, for serving, for somebody's learning how to serve. Do you have them walk through the steps of how to do that? Certainly. Yeah. Certainly, okay. And do they say it aloud and then internally or whatever else? Okay, different types of instruction. Self-instruction works wonderful. Sports coaches use it all the time, okay. We don't use it enough in the academic environment. We should, okay. And again, these are the steps for it. Adult model performs a task while basically, and I'm sure you do the same thing or whatever else. You demonstrate it for them, walk them through the steps, and then have them practice talking themselves through that, okay. Golfers, you see, it's funny when they learn golf. Is see people talking to themselves all the time. Keep the head down, whatever you know. In other words, that needs to be a point where it goes internal eventually. There, okay. Understand the whole concept of be changing behavior as we shape behavior. Don't ever expect it to change overnight. It's going to be by approximations. There. Think of it basically as weight gain and weight loss. If I wanted Steve to get onto the football team and we wanted to increase his you know, bench capacity from 200 to 300, it wouldn't go from 200 to 300. It would go 200 to 210 to 215. We'd do incremental. If it was weight, if I weigh 250 pounds and I want to get down to 200, it's not going to go from 250 to 200. It's going to go 250 to 245 incremental steps. Behavior is the same way. Incremental shape and changing of it there. Social skills training. If you are teaching in this classroom, ID, ED, or LD, you need to be teaching social skills just like every academic in instruction that you have. Math, reading, 
language arts, everything. Okay? If you're not, you're doing the kids a disservice. Okay? They all have skill deficits. Now, you don't have enough time in the day to create lesson plans or whatever else out there. Utilize the resources that are out there, like skill streaming. They have, you know, you, another program or anything? Okay. They have some specifically for your age group, whether it be elementary, middle school, high school. If it's not an issue in your class, certain lessons, skip that lesson, okay? But you need to, re maybe you revisit certain lessons that are issues with it again and again there. But you need to be teaching skill training. This is another thing is, when I have my teacher candidates go out there, not only do they see that they, you know, do a positive negative of the teacher observations is, ask, they sit down and interview, and one of the questions is, do you teach that? And it's like, well, when it comes up. If you went there and you go, okay, do you teach math in your classroom? And the teacher came back to you, well, if there's a need for it when it comes up and the needs are rising, would you be happy? No. Okay, I'm telling you is the skill streaming here, you know, the program of social skills is necessary for that. Stimulus Q, again, works great. This is one of our life students, again, for, uh, she was late to work all the time, gave her a vibrating watch that gave out the message to go for it. Ceiling, we called it a ceiling effect of 15 minutes. We sent her to work, okay? And this is with her watch. She was on all time. The next time is basically she kept asking, is it time for me to go to work? Is it time for me to work? The second day, again, she forgot about it back to the ceiling. We had to tell her. So, again, stimulus queuing works extremely wonderful with our students there. So use the sister technology there, okay? Structured non-instructional periods. Please don't just let them cut loose. I know you guys want to see each other. You know, when you go out to the recess area, you want to talk to your friends, other teachers, and everything else. Is it has to be in a structured setting, especially if you're dealing with kids with ED or whatever else. Okay. So the more structure that you can in the unstructured settings, let them have fun and everything else. But it has to be supervised in some type of activity there. Okay. If you just let them go, they're going to have fights. Okay. All right. Teaching interactions, this is, you know, teaching moment or whatever else. When you see something going on, please take advantage of that, even if it is cut into your 20-minute lunch break or whatever else is. Because, again, is you want to catch it while it's hot, while the iron's hot there. So when you see that behavior, talk to the child right away on that one there. Token economy. This is not bribery. This is not bribery, okay? I know many gen ed teachers are like, well, I'm not bribing a student. What is bribery? What's the definition of bribery? Unethical. Yes, unethical or illegal. I'm paying somebody to do something unethical or illegal. Reinforcing pro-social behavior is not bribery. Okay, and what it is is it's getting buy-in, and then again, you're removing that reinforcement. We're thinning the schedule over time. This is an important concept when you're talking to gen ed teachers. They don't understand the difference many times. They think this is basically bribery. You're bribing the kids to do something good. No, that is not true at any any sense of the imagination. There. Okay. So again, understand the token economy there. If you have, you have the kids in basically, you have a resource classroom, what you can do with the teachers is it goes, I don't have time to implement this in there, and that's fine. Give them a card, like a check in, check out, basically if he did good, great, poor, whatever, like a Likert scale, and then you can give him bucks based on his or her performance. Okay, so you can get 10 bucks for a really good period, five bucks for an average one or whatever else, and one buck at least for showing up. Never give on a Likert scale, never give zero or anything else, okay? Because zero means I didn't even come to or whatever else. Even if I showed up and I was difficult in your class, at least give me one point for showing up, okay? All right. Tracking. Tracking is important, but understand is be cautious of public posting. You know, this I find a lot, especially like elementary teachers do this all the time with a stoplight chart or whatever else. Well, Joey's always in red. Joey never moves from the bottom or whatever else. Be cautious because other parents are coming in and everything else will see what the student's doing. So if you're going to have a track in, it's good to have it as a folder or whatever else where you can track his or her own performance, but it's not visually displayed for everybody, okay? Especially if you have a non-responder. And the last thing we're going to talk about is the mildly intrusive uh, procedures there, okay? Administrative intervention, check in, check out, over correction, all the way down to work detail. My recommendation on this, where's my administrators? I am never, ever going to send a child down to your office unless absolutely required by the thing. In other words, it's fighting, destruction of property, something that has to happen, okay? The minute I send to the administrator, what have you just told the students? Who's the power broker? The administrator is the power broker. The minute you give it, you're giving up your power. Parents, the same thing at home. If you say, wait till your father or wait till your mother gets home, what have you just said? I am not, I'm not a power bro. I'm not in a power position there, okay? 
Keep the child in the classroom at all times. The simple fact is, is there any academic instruction going on in there? Absolutely zero. He may be helping out with papers or whatever, emptying in a trash can or something like that, but there's absolutely no academic instruction there. Okay, so we'll talk about different alternatives to that. Now, if it has to, if there's extreme behavior, then you have to, okay? So in other words, fighting, whatever your school rules are for the thing, destruction of property is, but only at that time. And even then is, I typically, as a BD teacher, I just back brief him. I just go at the end of lunch so he's not cold, you know, I don't want him flat-footed when a parent calls or whatever else is, but I basically brief as quickly as I can, but always in ED is we just keep him in the classroom there. We also have inter-class timeout, which we'll talk about in a second there. Check in, check out is a very evidence-based procedure there. Okay, so this is again is I have a problematic child who's constantly getting difficulties in a lot of different classes spread out. What it is is he meets with either a counselor or the SPED teacher first. We review what the goals are that he or she is supposed to go through, and then basically he has a checklist going to the different teachers and then she signs, did his work, did not do his work, or whatever else, and then comes back to me at the end of the day again. Okay, so check in, check out works extremely effective, but again, there's monitoring as we get the child from the beginning when he first steps foot on the school. Each teacher that he has gives a little quick feedback for the thing. We send it back to the parent. The parent acknowledges coming back again. And again, however you want to do that with parents in high school, it may be a little bit difficult. Maybe just initialing that you're aware of what's going on. But that way they realize when it was a good day, when it was a bad day. But again, this is more for the challenge, continuing challenging students there. Okay. Detention before and after school. I'm never a big fan of this. This gets into a lot of heated problems. How many of our kids are athletes? What happens when you're in detention? Who's pissed at me now? The coach is mad at me or whatever else there. What happens with school buses or whatever else? Yeah, who's giving the child a ride home because he can't do that? All these other issues that come in, and you don't even know half the family stories that are going to come in. Okay? In other words, he doesn't ride the bike, but that's the only time maybe the neighbor picks him up or whatever. I mean, there's going to be countless, are you, as an administrator, are there not countless family stories that you're going to run into with problematics with this one there? So I'm not a big fan of before and after. This one I love. This was your time. Now it's our time. Okay. In other words, is now basically his lunch attention is much better way. Now this is a funny one. This I always enjoyed is, and I've seen this. There's the lunch attention table. Okay. And I see a grown man arguing with young kids. Stop talking. What's a natural response that she's going to give 99 out of 100 times? Not talking. Not talking. You should what? <laughs> no, I'm not. I, 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 I'm, I'm, the person 40, 50 years old arguing with a little kid. Stop this. <laughs> the way to do lunch attention is this is lunch attention. Welcome, guys. Okay? I don't, I don't really care what you've been here for or whatever else. Eat quietly. When you're done, you're done. If you want to decide to talk or anything else, you come back tomorrow. Have a good lunch. That's it. At the end of the thing is, good job, good job. I'll see you tomorrow. Good job. There's no arguing. There's no, there's no back and forth, did, did not, or anything else. Okay? It's a very simplistic. Is the coach mad at me? Where's my volleyball coach? Are you mad? Did it mess, did it mess up with your thing? No. And again, is, you know, again, and we may need church share if there's a non-responder and she's here for a lunch, dining, you know, permanent dining chair now or whatever else. Maybe we'll talk again or on a different intervention. But initially for that, it's a much more effective way than do before or after school. Extinction. Okay, stopping reinforcement from behavior there. Be very careful with certain populations there, ED, autism, and ID, or whatever else. If I'm no longer reinforcing behavior, but even with gen ed kids, okay, calling out behavior. Lauren, you were calling out all the time, right? And I go up there and I say, just ignore Lauren whenever she does this. Lauren's in third grade. Do you think Lauren's just going to stop calling out? How many here are addicted to sodas? How many here can't get through the day without their Coke or whatever else? What time do you go get your Coke? Noon to two. Noon to two <laughs> o'clock, okay? So that gets her through the day, okay? And Cheryl, so Cheryl wants it there. So Cheryl's been going to the same Coke machine. It's a Diet Coke, Coke, what do you like? Diet Coke, Diet Coke. I, yeah. So she pops in her 75 cents every single school day from September to now, and she purchases her thing. And now it is, it's February 22nd. She you know, comes in tomorrow, and she puts in her 75 cents, and she presses that. She goes, man, it's been a rough day. But there's no kachunk. Nothing happens. Does Cheryl just go, oh, shucks, <laughs> and walk away? What does Cheryl do to that poor Coke machine? That's an extinction burst, okay? So the same thing is if I suddenly, if I was always reinforcing Lauren for calling out before and then I just ignore her, 
stand by for an extinction burst. That means she's gonna be calling, Mr. Wright, Mr. Wright. She's gonna be water skiing behind me, holding on to my jacket, pulling me through the classroom, whatever else is. That's an extinction burst. Now, eventually, Cheryl's gonna get tired of beating up that machine and realize the Diet Coke is never coming. She's gonna walk away and stop. Same thing as Lauren's gonna realize, I'm not gonna give her attention. There's two caveats here. One is you have to be able to tolerate that extinction burst. If it's a behavior like tantruming or anything else that you can't handle, okay, you can't use extinction. Okay, you can't do that because you're not going to be able to tolerate that. And if I give reinforcement to that, if I give her attention, so I'm working on the thing and I go, two plus time, blah, 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 that is, and Lauren spits it out and I go, good job, Lauren. Oh, I just reinforced her. Not only did I reinforce her, I gave her the most addictive type of reinforcing there was. Ratio. How does Vegas? Ratio. Random ratio. Do you understand what I'm saying is? That's why if you're going to do it, you have to be absolutely convinced that you cannot and will not reinforce Lauren's behavior. Okay? And you have to be able to tolerate that extinction burst. So if you can't answer those two questions, don't try it. Okay? Because you're going to make matters worse than better. Okay? That's why Vegas has done so well. Food delay. I use this with extreme caution, okay? The only recommend that I would use full delay is basically like, oh, who am I gonna pick on? Who loved those cookies out there? Nobody, nobody loved those cookies? Oh, come on, one person there. Kira, yeah. I saw you cutting the line there. Uh -huh. I did. So what do we do to Kira? back of the line. That's it. That's, that's the only delay that you have to do to make it effective, okay? Because you dropped them off at lunch, right? You have 20 minutes. You're in a hurry. Go. How many hot slices of pizza or chocolate milks are there? Pepperoni slices. In other words, there's the only so many there. The fact that I moved her from the front to the back is more than enough of a consequence, okay? And just to emphasize this, I'll show you. Do not withhold, and teachers have done this, there's been lawsuits, they withhold lunch, they forget about it or whatever else. What if the child was diabetic? What if the child was taking psychotropic medications and needed the food? You don't know half the story, the underlying stories are there. Do not use it for other than a momentary to put it at the back of the line. And just to show you how powerful food delay is, this is my favorite of all. Okay, sit in that chair. All right, here's the deal. Marshmallow, for you. You can either wait, and I'll give you another one if you wait, or you can eat it now. When I come back, I'll give you two, another one, so then you'll have two. But stay in here and stay in the chair till I come back, okay? okay. All right. I'm gonna go do something and then I'll come back. It smells yummy. Oh, it smells really good. So it's up to you. You can have it now or you can wait. Okay? I'll be back. Stay in the chair, okay? Okay. So I'm going to leave and then I'll come back, okay? 
So you can either eat it right now or you can wait. Either way, okay? Okay. How'd you do? Did you do good? You did? Yeah. You wanted to eat it, didn't you? Yeah. So did I tell you to give you another one? Okay, now you can have both. You need them. <laughs> All right, that was on delayed gratification study. As they found out as the kids get older, those that could delay gratification did much better in school. But again, my recommendation on food delay is, dude, if you see teachers do that, do not hold it for any amount of time. Just put them in the back of the line or whatever else is because there's so many other factors that can contribute that you can just get the school in serious trouble for. Okay. ISS, and this varies tremendously on the effectiveness of ISS. Okay. Some are I've seen extremely well where it's academic interventions that provide there. But what happens? Are they receiving special education services while they're there? Who often runs the ISS? Secretary, coaches, many times it's coaches or whatever else there. And again, watch out for that inadvertent reinforcement there is if the volleyball coach is running it and I get kicked out, do you think I'm really feeling any punishment or anything else there when I get to hang out with the person? You know, it's like, so understand the whole dynamics of ISS and are you providing academic and proper uh, academic instruction for kids with disabilities there, okay? Overcorrection. Uh, I use this a lot there, okay? Restitutional overcorrection is basically restoring the environment. And we've all used this. The kid draws on the, on the desk, what do you do? Clean up the desk and restore it back to the thing, okay? Nothing wrong with that there. Positive practice, highly recommend doing it. I use this all the time. I use it because of coaching and I use it a lot in, into the academic environment, okay? Volleyball, I'm gonna pick on you again, even though she doesn't have her first name on that tag on me. Stephanie. Stephanie, Stephanie, so Coach Stephanie. Yes. So when I'm, you're teaching me to serve, and, and I kind of screw it up. What do you make me do? Try it again. Try it again, right? And you keep reemphasizing the same thing. Coaches do it night and day. We do it for writing, right? For teaching the letter C. How do we do this again? I use this for behavior. So a kid goes running down the hall. Steve, whoa, slow down, buddy. Slow down. Whoa, 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 whoa. Do me a favor. Let's try this again. And I come back and I go, you know, Steve, that was good. It was almost like catwalk good, but not perfect yet. Let's try it again one more time. After I do two or three of those iterations, do you think Steve's going to run by my classroom anymore? No. I mean, he's going to hit the brakes. He may run by somebody else. He may discriminate in certain classrooms or whatever, but understanding his positive practice is reinforcing very effective intervention there. Neutral practice. This one I'm not a fan of at all, okay? And I was not a fan as, as when I was in sports or whatever else. I'm not a fan in academics. It's making a person do something completely unrelated to the task at home. So what happened when you were late for practice? What, what do you do? Push-ups or whatever else. So push-ups must be a bad thing. Is push-ups a bad thing? No. Push-ups, like, <laughs> it's just like, yeah, it is. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it. Or what, make run laps. Is running a bad thing? With obesity skyrocketing across the nation, running is a good thing. I don't want people thinking it's a bad thing. What do teachers do in the school? So I get in trouble. What do I do in detention? Work. Schoolwork. What kind of work? Writing. Writing must be a very bad thing. So I've got every teacher in the school working so hard to say writing is a good thing and how to do an intervention with writing. And you, there's workshops here. How to, you know, there's one called I Hate Writing or whatever else there. And then what do I got? I got other people using it as a, basically as a weapon saying it is a bad thing. You don't want to do this. So I'm not a huge fan of neutral practice over correction there. Okay, I like positive practice there. I think what do you want me to do and have me repeat what you want me to do. But I'm not a big fan of neutral practice over correction. Full cleanliness. We use this a lot with ID populations there. I've used that even in the college here program. There. People try to get out of work, smear feces over work environment, whatever else, you'll see this constantly. So if you work with ID population doing that. So how do we do this? Not only clean up the mess, like the writing, but we're going to clean up the entire bathroom. We're going to sanitize everything or, in regards to that, okay? And if you do that once or twice, trust me, that behavior stops. You'll see that behavior terminated really quickly there. Okay. It's challenging is, is identifying the culprit though, especially if you're working with that population is you have four or five potential, so you just can't blame anybody, you have to be specific and that's why it's important, restroom checks on a regular basis, everything else, so if that occurs. Required relaxation, 
This is important to teach kids how to relax, especially ED kids, children with autism, whatever else is, how to calm themselves down. I've got, we're, we're kind of running out of time, so I won't do the video, but you can click on the link when you get that though. Basically breathing relaxation, sometimes like the, you know, here the turtle, whatever, you know, bring yourself in, count to three, relax, numerous different strategies that you can use based on age appropriate interventions there. Response cost, this is highly effective. Again, if you're using a token economy, and then you elect to break my pencil or do something, damage something, well, that costs just like in real life, right? That costs so much bucks or whatever else. So rather than you go into the store, that you just purchase the pencil that you purchased there. Be very careful, we'll talk about this tomorrow with the cycle of aggression there. If I know Chelsea's already in the peak cycle, I'm not gonna give the consequence of that time. All I'm doing is fanning a fire that's already in existence. So I'm gonna wait for her to calm down and then the consequence comes afterwards. Too often teachers throw a consequence when a child's at the peak cycle. That's not a good idea. The only thing you're concerned about when the child's at the peak is safety, okay? So the last thing I want to do is start throwing draw lines in the sand and threatening her or anything else. When she's calmed down again, then we'll talk about what the consequences of the actions are. All right, startle, again, I only recommend using this for safety only, especially for, you know, in other words, as a child walks into the, you know, the bus lane or whatever else or something does something unsafe is, basically it's a response to get him and her to respond very quickly to you. If you use startle too much, how many here have had teachers or neighbors that always kind of yelled or whatever else? You kind of become tone deaf to it, okay? So you don't want to use this too much. You want that startle voice, if you have to use that command, that I know he or she's going to lock in a second so they don't get hit by a car or whatever it may be, okay? Timeout, okay? Different types of timeout here, inclusion, exclusion, and we're not going to talk about the other one that I don't like at all, seclusion. I don't know if you have any of those rooms, but I do a lot of research trying to reduce the use of that for ED. Inclusion is the only one that's evidence-based. This is the only procedure that's evidence-based that shows it works in reducing behavior. And again, simple rules. One minute per age. If the kid's five, no more than five minutes. If the kid's 12, no more than 12 minutes or whatever in regards to that, okay? Inclusion timeout, he or she's still in the classroom, okay? If Rockham's causing problems, I may separate her chair a little bit from Steve so she, he or she doesn't instigate or whatever else. She can't be reinforced during that stage during the timeout but she's still exposed to everything that's going on academically. Well, I'm talking world history or whatever it may be, okay? Exclusion is when I remove the child from the timeout. How many here have been with me? Hall monitor duty for like several hours on a time in the thing where the teacher forgot you out in the hallway or whatever else, okay? Raise your hands. Come on, somebody else has been out there. I've had kids out there the whole day that they recognize, the teacher recognized as they're going to lunch or getting out, and they suddenly remember that they left the kid out there, okay? Exclusion timeout is not evidence-based, and it does not work. The simple fact is, A, he or she's not being monitored, okay, by an adult, okay? Are they in an academic environment? No, okay? My recommendation, if you want to get it to the point is, many, I'll, I'll get to it in a second here, well, I'll leave it at this one, I'll this here, I just would love for an interclass. Basically, is the problem with many timeouts is, is what's happening is Kira's having an issue with me. It's a behavioral issue with the teacher and the child. Okay, inclusion timeout, Kira hasn't settled down is, Kira needs to get away from me as much as I need to get away from her. So what I have is an agreement with Miss Lisa that when we have these instances that she will send me her challenging students, I will send my challenging students. An interclass timeout is, you go to the classroom, they're still being monitored by another adult, they're not interfering, you have a space in the back of the classroom where she just sits. When a natural break comes in your classroom, she's been sitting for a while, you just give a piece of paper and it has the same thing as, what did I do? What would I do differently next time or whatever? And she goes, I talked out to Mr. Ryan because I hate him and he dies, whatever. <laughs> Is she ready to come back to my classroom yet? No. You go on teaching your classroom or whatever and you come back again on na next natural pause. And he goes, I was disrespectful of Mr. Ryan. Next time I'll ask for a blah, blah, blah timeout or whatever else or, or something along those lines. That makes sense? Do you want to keep her in your classroom all day long? because you have too few students already? <laughs> no, when the child's ready to go back, it gave her an opportunity to calm down, it gave me as a teacher an opportunity to calm down, now you come back, Joe, she's ready to come back to your classroom. Interclass timeout works very effectively, and while she's not in my math class, she's still in your history class or whatever else, she's in an educational environment, she's being monitored by an adult, okay, she's not being left out there, a much more effective way to do that than just putting a child out in the class or out in the hallway there. So my recommendation is use an interclass timeout if you're going to do that. The other one I would definitely not use, and I've done more research on these, is the seclusion timeouts. They're dangerous and everything else is. And if your argument is, as well, we can't manage the child's behavior, then my recommendation is it's probably an inappropriate placement. 
Okay, and you're talking about an education placement level that he or she probably needs a special day school or residential if the child's that violent that you're controlling them in a, in a thing. So for residential facilities, by all means, I've worked with them. They're very safely monitored. There's policies there, but the problem with the state level using them is very little training on the staff part for de-escalation, very little training in actual policy procedures for how they're designed and implemented. Okay, verbal reprimand. And again, basically, this is not yelling at the student, uh, the thing is, but basically, it's basically giving them a stern talking to. You know, in other words, it's not yelling, it's I should put the circle with the red thing, whatever, through that. It's not yelling at him, but basically giving him or her a stern talk to that this violated our norms or our policies or procedures there. Principles are very, where's my principles? You guys mastered this one there. Oh, which one? <laughs> talking number 507, what do I give? Okay, work detail. And again, this one, what I do is, again, I let you know the Disney characters, but basically is if the child does something littering or whatever else, then what does he have to do during recess? Yeah, pick up the recess area or whatever else, clean up or whatever else, but make sure that he or she's not doing anything dangerous, chemicals or anything else, but make it consistent to what, you know, the responsibilities are there. All right, I'm supposed to leave like 10 minutes for questions and everything there uh, for, for things, because again, we covered a vast array. I would not use all these interventions here in my classroom. What it is, the concept is, is to pick ones that you are comfortable with and developing that you would bring enough broad array, because remember, not every student's gonna respond to every intervention that you try. You need to have a host of different interventions that you can try there. I will be here for the next couple of minutes or whatever else, but again, thank you so much for coming. Uh, have a wonderful conference. It was great meeting y'all. Thank you. You're welcome.